All right, music fans, welcome back. Harmless Dave here talking about real music in real time for a few real people out there just like you and just like me. So I'm going to be talking about how music died, not, you know, the American Pie thing, but I've I've spoken about this before, but I stumbled upon this article and I just need to go through this just to kind of get it out of my system. That's all. And again, I'm going to have a lot of people disagree with me. Um, I'm going to be accused of being the old man on the front porch yelling at the kids to get off the lawn. So be it. OK, um, before I get there, here's something that came out last year. Uh, this band is called Streetlight, obviously, and the album is called Ignition. Another Swedish import or export, depending on how you look at it. Um, hard to put this in one category. At times, it's very AOR. At other times, it rocks out a little bit more than just your typical AOR type album. But uh, pretty decent songs. Pretty interesting band. Um, definitely some hit single potential on here. And yes, they are a real rock band. In fact, there they are. All right, courtesy of our friends over at Frontiers Music. Now, um, this article from 2016. So this is eight years old. I stumbled upon this because I typed in some stuff about the 1990s because I wanted to see if anyone had ever written anything critical of what happened in the 1990s. And the article that I ran into is called Why Rock Never Really Got Over the Early 90s. So I'm looking at that headline going, okay, finally, yeah, I'm going to read this, and they're going to agree with me. So here's how the article starts. Over the past few years, I've noticed a strange sort of nostalgia developed for the late 80s hair metal trend, which puzzles me. This written by somebody uh, called Chris Lane. All right. Uh, sure, almost everything is cyclical and musical trends come and go, but it boggles my mind to see young people romanticize an era when the radio and MTV bombarded us with musical abominations, musical abominations, like Britney Fox and Bang Tango. Sure, good bands like Junkyard and The Cult also get grouped in with that derivative scene, but they were exceptions. Now, uh, when we're talking about Britney Fox and Bang Tango, first of all, this is what we call a straw man argument. OK, that's a straw man. Um, they were also bombarding us with Guns N' Roses, uh, Poison, um, Danger, Danger. Uh, and those aren't musical abominations. Now, go back and listen to Britney Fox and Bang Tango. Um, Britney Fox was trying to be Cinderella, okay? And there's nothing wrong with Cinderella. Uh, not sure who Bang Tango was trying to be. I think they're sort of original. But if those are musical abominations, then count me in as being nostalgic for some uh, musical abomination. All right? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so this guy is essentially, you know, saying, look, I can't understand why kids, younger people would romanticize an era when the radio and MTV bomb and where's MTV now, by the way, MTV isn't bombarding us with anything anymore. At least they were, uh, bombarding people with abominations like Britney Fox and Bang Tango. And I'm pretty sure neither of those bands were in even light rotation at MTV for more than a week. So that's what I mean by the straw man argument. Now, I wasn't going to do a screen share here, but I'm going to do a screen share just to show people that then we've got the picture of the late uh, Janie Lane here to illustrate. And, uh, of course, Cherry Pie. We're, we're always going to talk about how bad cherry pie was and i'm not saying the subject matter isn't a little touch and go but the song itself um melodic up tempo 
Um, it's a fun song. I'm not endorsing the message of what cherry pie is all about, but just the picture here of uh, Janie Lane, just to illustrate how ridiculous this was to everybody. All right, so I'm done sharing that part. Uh, when grunge, here we go. When grunge came along a few short years later and made bands like Warrant unfashionably cool almost overnight, it seemed like a breath of fresh air to many music fans. Mm, some music fans, maybe. Um, and of course, he doesn't talk about what this did to the industry, how this destroyed the livelihood of everyone involved with um, these abominations, these bands that were just so horrible that he can't understand why there's any nostalgia for this type of music. This is really um, like the anti-Dave article here. So that's why I'm getting a little bit, um, I don't know, a little exercised a bit, but not too much. He goes on to say, it seemed like a breath of fresh air to many music fans who had grown weary of the increasingly generic spandex clad bands that had dominated hard rock for years. Now, this isn't just about fashion, okay? Admittedly, I look back at 80s fashion with uh, hard rock bands or just, you know, generic bands, and it, it is a little creepy. It, it's a little cringeworthy. Um, but in those days, it wasn't. I'm talking about the music, not just the look. Now, I will say this about the look. These guys were having fun. Whether you liked the way they looked or not, fun and rock and roll went together. In the 90s, fun departed from rock and roll and was replaced by doom and self-loathing. All right? So let's continue. He goes on to say, it may be true that every rose has its thorn, but it's also true that there were a lot of bleepy power ballads on the radio back then. Oh, power ballads, huh? So power ballads are really bad. Um, look, power ballads, by the way, were appealing um, to women and to men. But oftentimes, uh, women loved power ballads and, and men would gravitate toward the women who loved power ballads. Um, power ballads are actually kind of difficult uh, to record. And some of the greatest music probably in the world uh, might be uh, in the power ballad category. Power ballads tend to win Grammy awards, right? And they tend to stick in your brain long after the song is over. Now, you could say that maybe the quality of power ballads was going downhill. I didn't see any of that. Even 1990 and 1991 had a fair share of really great power ballads. So totally disagree on this point. So you got to get rid of those power ballads because you don't want people, you know, enjoying a slow song with the person that they love in a normal relationship, which, you know, this is 2016 here. So this this is the beginning of how the culture, I don't know about the beginning, but it's, it's in the midst of how the culture is unraveling. Um, eight years ago, yeah, yeah, I would, I would say this is putting the hammer down on some nostalgia that you're not supposed to enjoy here. So then the 90s rolled around, and within a couple of years, bands that I never thought would percolate into the mainstream were suddenly doing just that, and in a huge way. And the 90s were a great decade for rock music. Oh. <laughs> Even though it was hard, get this, it was hard for some to get accustomed to seeing bands they'd watched in small clubs go on to become huge stars in just a few years. Let me um, just kind of stop reading there. Um, I did the 80s college radio thing, and our radio station, we were cutting edge. We were in trade publications. Um, we were named Atlantic Records pick hit radio station uh, for the United States. Our radio station. We would pick songs 
before they would become popular. And it's a thing that we did because we would go and listen to the music and then we would tell the record people, we would say, hey, um, I know you want this song as a single, but we think this one over here is better. And our audience is listening and the phones used to light up and they used to say things like, hey, what are you playing? What was that song you just played? Wow, I really like that song. What is it? Where you don't typically get that kind of feedback today. But I lived through the alternative scene in the 80s, which um, kind of evolved into the grunge scene of the 90s. I would have to say that the alternative scene of the 80s had had more nuance, uh, had more variety to it than what the sound evolved into in the 90s, which became very monolithic. So, but he's um, he's talking here how he used to go to small clubs and now they're huge stars. He says, in retrospect, the first half of that decade feels like it was the last era in which rock music was among the most important aspects of America's youth culture. Now, again, I'm not going to give my age away as far as how old I was at that time, but I know rock music was enjoyed by a certain demographic. It wasn't just for the youth culture. Um, we were always looking for an audience. I believe 25 to 54 was our main strategy to get those people, that age group, to listen to our radio station because they would spend money, they would go to concerts. And so you had people who were in their 50s, right, who were listening to great music. But I can almost guarantee you that the upper end of that bracket, that age range, completely vanished once this music started. Because I remember the tail end of my time in radio and people saying, what is that bleep that you're playing? Play the Rolling Stones. Play Led Zeppelin. Pay, play Pink Floyd. Stop playing this crap. What are you playing? I got those phone calls. And I would say it's a new song by you know Pearl Jam or Soundgarden. And people would say, that stuff sucks. All right? Um, so th this wasn't youth culture. Now, again, maybe the 15 and 16-year-olds were all super excited. First of all, they didn't have to look the part. They could wear the flannel shirts and the jeans. That was a real easy style, the ripped jeans and the flannel shirts. I even liked it. I didn't mind the style. I just actually I liked the grunge look as far as what you could wear. Right. Uh, but I didn't like the music, whereas maybe I didn't care for all the spandex and weird stuff um, from the 80s. But the music was 100 times better. That's just my humble um, opinion about this. So anyway, they talk about um, America's youth culture. Remember the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Does it? Does it inspire youth culture? Who cares? Does it inspire everybody? Why does it have to inspire youth culture? First of all, youth culture knows nothing about life yet. All right? So if they're inspired by something, great. But are they the most intelligent people on the planet? No, they're not. They're the most naive. They're most gullible. Uh, the most likely to make a million mistakes before they learn from their mistakes. So why should we just cater toward a group of people that haven't even found what they want to be or what they want to do in life. Youth culture. Oh, well, it's the youth that drives every. No, it's not the youth. You have to grow up before you start to change the world. You think if you're, look, I'm not saying young people can't do great things, but for the most part, young people are immature and they have to grow up a bit. And I'm not sure how everything has to like cater to them. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame says this all the time. Did it affect youth culture? Because rock and roll is the music of, you know, 15. No, it's not. Not anymore. And it kind of wasn't back then. I mean, maybe a little bit, but it's, I mean, when I was 15, yeah, I was listening to rock and pop. But it wasn't like, you know, I was 15 thinking to myself, 
who's the next groundbreaking guitar player who I can um, be inspired by? My life would change drastically if I could just hear somebody who was super inspirational. Well, I knew about Eric Clapton and Ted Nugent uh, and a number of great guitar players, Eddie Van Halen, really, if you want to, that he probably affected. I had a friend who played guitar because of Eddie and he dressed like Eddie and he, he tried to imitate Eddie and everything he said and did, which was hilarious, but he was 15. So he's mimicking. He wasn't, like changing the world, but it, it's, it was cool for sure. I'm not saying it wasn't cool, but um, I think the way people, especially these rock critics come along and they, and they just, they throw out these things that when you examine them, it's, it's like the emperor has no clothes, just it's silly. So the next sentence is even more silly. The way previously marginalized musical styles suddenly exploded into the spotlight made it all especially an exciting time. And suddenly there were a lot more musical options to choose from. What? What? This is exactly the opposite of what happened. He's saying there were more musical options to choose from. So... He, he talks about how, you know, the abominations of, you know, Bang Tango and I uh, can't even remember the other band, um, Britney Fox, how those bands, you know, were actually on MTV. And then, thank goodness, grunge comes along and wipes those things out overnight. And so how do we have more choices <laughs> How do we have more musical options? No, we have fewer. And then, of course, the rise of hip hop and rap, which overtakes the pop scene. And everything that's pop has to have a little hip hop and rap in it. And everything that's rock has to be dark. Now, again, those bands, they were still around, but the record labels dropped them and said, bye bye. We can make more money doing this. And Promotions are easier, and uh, we're just going to tell everybody this is what's cool now. And that's exactly what they did, because I used to talk to record guys, and they would say, Dave, it's not me. Uh, they think they can make more money with this, and um, that, that, was, that was the line. They think they can make more money with this, so um, here we go. Now, the guy goes on to say, unfortunately, as with every creative renaissance, there were only so many truly great bands. <laughs> Translation, um, and I forget who said this recently, about, oh, it was Desmond Child, who said that these guys couldn't play their instruments. Desmond Child, I trust his point of view on this. He was there, he was producing, he was listening, and, and he, he knew. He, he knew that these guys couldn't play their instruments. So... There were so, only so many truly great bands. How about translation? All of these bands kind of sounded alike. All right? Now, you can critique, you know, the 80s and Cinderella and Bon Jovi and all that, and they, but they all kind of don't sound exactly the same. Rat. Who else sounds like Rat? Nobody. Nobody sounds like Rat, whether you like them or not. So I, it, it's just or a really kind of stupid take here. And that's my, again, this is my point of view, reading this article from 2016. By the late 90s, the really good ones, most of them had been perfecting their music for years before mainstream discovery had started to dry up and fewer original newer groups began filling the airwaves. <laughs> After they destroyed the industry, no wonder. With no more Red Hot Chili Peppers or L7s to choose from, record labels began to sign bands like Bush, Creed, Nickelback, and Limp Biscuit. Smash, Smash Mouth was popular. Ooh, they were popular. They had two hit songs, three, two or three. Those were increasingly dark days. And one thing about Smash Mouth is they actually were melodic. They weren't a dark band. They were 
sort of alternative pop. Anyway, those were increasingly dark days for a decade that had seemed as if it had gotten off to such a refreshing start. <laughs> Over the following decade, even less interesting rock bands began to gain widespread success, and it's no wonder young people aren't enthralled with that music. The late 90s were also the birth of widespread file sharing, and while some people had been illegally copying music on cassette tapes, or in much rarer circumstances, actually sold um, vinyl bootlegs of albums in previous generations. Vinyl bootlegs? I don't remember the vinyl bootlegs. Anyway, Napster and other similar services definitely made it easier. At the time, more and more people began to use the internet, quickly changing society and the way we enjoy music forever. Along the way, young people started growing up in a post-internet world where music and movies were theirs for the taking without much comprehension that downloading copyrighted content without paying for it is really stealing. All right, so this article continues to go on, and I'm not going to continue to go on with it because it's tedious. Um, but this actually, in a backhanded way, makes as, as continues to make the point I make about the 90s. Now, Yes, the file sharing, all of that stuff ruined music, but music was kind of ruined by the 90s. He, he basically says it like by the late 90s, because you can only do that one sound so many times over and over again. Um, people aren't driven by negativity. They're, they're not inspired by negativity. And say what you want, again, about Britney Fox and Bang Tango, your straw man argument. Um, people loved Poison. They loved Def Leppard. They loved all of these iconic bands that, by the way, are still around and people are more than just nostalgic for them. They're still following them, even though I think some of them need to quit because they're getting too old to do this. But they're essentially the standard bearers of a style that is fading away and, and it's fading away quite rapidly. Whether you're a fan of a 60s British invasion band like The Who, uh, whether you're a fan of 70s bands, and many of them are still around, but not too many of them. The 80s, of course. I mean, the 80s just, I think, was the pinnacle of melody and all of these different things coming together. Oh, no, here comes a keyboard. Can't have those. We need darkness here. Keyboards, that's bad. There's more melody there. It's cheesy. Um, even the early 90s, like 90, 91, I was listening to High Enough by the Damn Yankees. What a great song. Isn't that kind of a power ballad? Power ballad-ish? It's another crappy, he says there are all these crappy power ballads on the radio. Damn Yankees? That's a, the crappy, the guitar work in that is in, incredible. The vocals, amazing. <laughs> Do you say that about grunge bands? I know there are people, Soundgarden and all this stuff. Oh, one of the greatest singers of all time. And I'm just like, compared to who? Compared to compared to like 20 guys from the 80s and 70s. 40 guys from the, from, I'm just, my brain is kind of going, no, there's way more. The point being is that the best music arrived before the grunge scene and what grunge did was it just demolished the whole scene and the older bands said screw this and they kept making albums and record labels either weren't putting them out there they would sign the band and do nothing to promote it because they had found their cash cow and yes napster and all the file sharing came later and there should be rules about all this stuff you shouldn't just be able to, you know, download for free or copy a file and save it and all this stuff. That's not good, and it should be illegal. Um, but you know, um, like Tom Petty said, what should what he said? You have to uh, pay for what you used to get for free. In this case, you're getting for free what you used to have to pay for, and it, it's wrong and it's hurt the artists. It's hurt musicians. 
and by the way, it's it's hurt some of these older bands that are just trying to make a living. They're not going to sell any albums because nobody's going to promote their music. Nobody's putting it on the radio. Nobody even in like the satellite radio business would put like a new song out there up against all the old stuff they're playing. There are all these stations like Classic Vinyl and Classic Rewind. If an older artist that you're constantly playing on that channel comes out with a new song and it's good, you, you should be doing them a favor. Put it on the radio. But again, they're all scared. They're all afraid they're going to lose their audience. You've already got their money, so you have nothing to lose. Oh, I'm going to cancel my subscription to Sirius XM. You played a new song the other day. I want to hear Pour Some Sugar on Me, and that's it. That's what I'm paying for. <laughs> All right, folks, I have gone too long on this one. Either you're going to hate this video or you're going to love it. The 90s, did it destroy the music industry? Yes and yes. And it isn't uh, a cultural thing. It's a music thing, right? Um, I know spandex, Dave, is really creepy. It's, it's really cheesy. Okay, but what about the music itself? You could have dressed, I mean, styles change, like dress, look at the 70s, the bell bottoms and the collared shirts and all that. I mean, that was kind of cool. The 60s too, with all the stuff going on in the 60s. And of course, the 80s, I thought was good for a while. And maybe it got out of hand. Maybe it wasn't the, the best style, but um, the music was spot on. So anyway, here's uh, Streetlight. Check this out. It's a new band. They're from Sweden. Um, it's melodic, so it's kind of cheesy. So you might not like it. This is their album Ignition. This is a real rock band putting out real rock music that you can listen to that isn't dark, that's not going to make you contemplate suicide or anything like that. This is just good music. And you know what? In the world we're currently living in, um, we've had 30 plus years of dark music, the dark matter I talked about. That's the new song by Pearl Jam, Dark Matter. Exactly. We're living in dark matter. We we need some light in dark times. Now, little evangelism here. The only real light is Jesus, right? And there's some pretty good Christian music out there, to be honest with you. It's not all bad. I mean, some of it's really good. And so you need a message. You need something uplifting. And uh I don't know. I'm just thinking 30 years of darkness. And this guy said everything is cyclical, but it but it hasn't been. And we all know this to be true, that rock music isn't going to make a comeback. Um, and it's not going to be the music of, of youth culture again. That has been hip hop and R&B and all that stuff, that rap stuff, which, you know, some of it is OK. I'll say this, some of it's okay, some of it's creative, but um, if you want variety, if you want the way it used to be where everything kind of coexisted on the radio together, you got to go back to the 1980s. That's the last decade, especially the early part of the decade, where all of that stuff coexisted. You'd have country and rock and pop and R&B, and then later on you had a little bit of rap, which was okay because it wasn't the obnoxious kind of rap. It was almost like a novelty thing, which it was almost like comedy on the radio, like the tone lokes of the world. That was, that was fun. It was entertaining. Um, didn't elevate the music or anything, but um, it was okay. But then everything kind of got nasty after that. So that's my take on that. Some of it, again, is creative and interesting, and I'm not throwing all of it under the bus. But for me in my house, uh, we like to listen to rock, all right, and decent rock. And it could be a number of different styles. And we like country, and we like uh, some jazz, and we like some R&B, um, the way things used to be. So, yes, I guess I really am the old man on the porch yelling at the kids, uh, but they're not going to get off the lawn anytime soon.